I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I don't know about you, but I find that Christmas takes a long time to arrive but is very quickly forgotten. Uh, For a whole month from the first day of November, uh, right through to the last second of Christmas Eve, every shop and supermarket seems to be filled with Christmas. And then finally Christmas Day arrives and passes in a blizzard of turkey and stuffing. And before you've even opened the good biscuits, it's all over and done with. If it were just a a seasonal phenomenon, then I guess it wouldn't be too serious. But I find that it's often a spiritual problem too. For a whole month, I sing carols and listen to readings to, to remind myself of all that God has done for me by sending his son, Jesus, into the world. And then as soon as I finish my last mince pie, I'm onto all the things that I'm going to do for God in the year ahead. I'll crack that new Bible reading plan. I'll finally make enough time to pray. I'll get over that bad habit. Before long, you're in the thick of January, weighed down by all the things that you've got to do, feeling a bit guilty about some of the things that you haven't done. Christmas takes a long time to arrive, but is very quickly forgotten. Which is why I thought it might be helpful to take a look at this passage from Galatians. Um, It happens to be one of the set readings for today in the Book of Common Prayer. And as usual, Cranmer's instincts were superb. Because the Galatians too needed to be reminded of God's grace. Uh, They'd heard the gospel around the 40s AD from the Apostle Paul. But they'd very quickly forgotten about the grace that they'd heard And we're turning instead to a different gospel, one of Jesus plus Judaism, grace plus law, faith plus works, God's kindness plus my efforts. And the message that they needed to hear to stop them turning back to legalism is the very same message that we need to hear if we're to remember God's grace in the year ahead. Don't turn away from Jesus. Don't go back to slavery. Because before Jesus, we were slaves. But now, we are sons through God. Those are going to be our two points this morning. So firstly, before Jesus, we were slaves. In verses 1 and 2, back over the page, Paul uses an illustration to describe our situation before Jesus. Have a look down with me at verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. A few weeks ago, I became a godfather for the very first time. And one day, my baby godson, Benji, will own everything that his parents have, their house, their furniture, their savings, their possessions, everything. But until he comes of age, until he grows up, he will be treated like a little slave. 
He will have to do what he's told. Do your homework. Eat your greens. Go and tidy your room. And if he doesn't, he'll be punished. Go to the naughty set. Go and think about what you've done. And in verse 3, Paul says that is an analogy for our spiritual situation before Jesus. Verse 3, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. That word, elementary, in verse 3, it could mean elementary in the sense of basic, uncomplicated, like elementary school. Uh, Or it could mean elementary in the sense of to do with the elements of the world, the physical elements, earth, wind, fire, water. But whichever meaning is right, the point is the same. Before Jesus, we were slaves. We had to do what we were told. And if we didn't, we were punished. And that was true both for the Jews and for the Gentiles. Uh, So the Jews, they were enslaved under the law of Moses. Uh, If you look up the page at chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, Now before faith came, we Jews were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. They had to do what God's law said. And when they couldn't, they were punished. They were sent into exile. And the Gentiles, well, they were even an even worse form of slavery. If you look down the page, or just over the page, at chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says they were enslaved to pagan gods. Verse 8, formerly, when you did not know God... You were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. They forced themselves to serve the wit and whim of whatever god they'd made up for themselves, fearing that if they got it wrong, if they didn't sacrifice exactly when they were meant to, or to exactly the right god that they were supposed to, they'd be punished. That was our situation before Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile, we were slaves. Of course, that's not to say that Jew and Gentile were in exactly the same position. Of course, the Jews had an infinitely better slave master. Far better to be a slave under God's good laws than under evil pagan gods. But a slave is a slave all the same. And before Jesus, both Jew and Gentile were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, to religious systems that were elementary, basic, for spiritual children before Jesus, that were concerned with the physical elements, with food and drink, feasts and festivals, sacrifices and ceremonies. A few years ago, I tried to get my wife, Hannah, to watch the film 12 Years a Slave with me. Unfortunately, it's a rather gruesome film, and she ended up leaving about two minutes in. But, you know, I had a nice time. If you're familiar with the film, you'll know that it follows the journey of Solomon Northup, a free black man living in the north of America, who is kidnapped and forced into slavery. And over the course of the film, He's enslaved to two different masters, one who treats him kindly and well, the other a cruel psychopath who bullies and abuses him. But in both cases, he is held a slave, captive, forced to do his master's will against his own. And so it was for us before Jesus came, Jew and Gentile may have been under different masters, one good and kind, the law of God, one sadistic and cruel, paganism and false religion, but both held captive, trapped under a religious system, punished if we couldn't keep the rules perfectly perfectly. 
And many people today still live like that. I happen to live opposite a mosque, and every morning at dawn when I get up, I I see my Muslim neighbors lining up in the streets outside, waiting to pray, desperate to keep the rules, fearing God's displeasure if they don't. Then I get on my bike and cycle past Mile End Tube Station, where bleary-eyed city workers file onto the central line for another day slaving away in service of profit or career or ambition or whatever other god they may have made for themselves. The other day at one of the carol services, I was chatting to a Catholic friend, and I asked him, what's it like to be a Catholic? And he replied, the thing about Catholicism is there's a lot of guilt. You have to keep the rules be at mass at the right time or the right frequency. And if you don't, then you get marked down in God's good books. You're a spiritual failure. Maybe you've been looking into the Christian faith and you thought that's what all Christianity was like. Or maybe you would call yourself a Christian and that's what you've turned to embrace, a way of thinking that suggests You can earn your way into heaven. I imagine for most of us, we probably haven't gone that far. And yet I certainly still find it easy, perhaps perhaps especially on New Year's Eve, to slip into that attitude, to start acting as if my, my spiritual status depended on my spiritual performance. I've got to do this. God will think less of me if I don't. I have to read my Bible today. I've got to squeeze in those full six six hours of prep for that Bible study. I've got to bring at least five guests to the next Christianity Explored. If I don't, I'm a spiritual failure. It's so easy to start thinking like a slave. And before Jesus came, when we were spiritual children, that's what we were. But now, after Christmas, but now that Jesus has come, we are no longer slaves, but sons through God. Which brings us to our second point but now we are sons through God. In verses four to seven, Paul declares how God has radically changed our spiritual status from slavery to sonship. And he focuses on two actions. God sent his son and God sent his spirit. God sent his son. Look down with me at verse four. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Every single phrase in that sentence is laden with significance but when the fullness of time had come. The birth of Jesus Christ marks the turning point of history. Everything before him is before the fullness of time. Everything after him is the fullness of time. The waiting was over when he arrived. The date designated by God the Father in his eternal wisdom for his son to enter the world and bring his children into the fullness of their inheritance had arrived at his coming. I don't know why God chose exactly the hour he did, but hasn't his wisdom been vindicated as through Jesus the gospel has gone out to the ends of the earth because of that very first Christmas? Christmas. 
but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Notice that it says his son. Jesus Christ is no mere man. He is the eternal pre-existent son of the father. The word of God, begotten before all worlds. God from God, light from light, begotten not made, of one being with the father, through whom all things were made. And yet in spite of his divinity, in spite of his divine privilege and status, he was born of woman. He came into the world, taking upon himself a complete and sinless humanity, Godhead veiled in flesh, incarnate deity. And he was born under the law. That is, he subjected himself to the commandments of God that enslaved us and kept them perfectly so that he might achieve the purpose for which he came. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. To redeem means to release via means of exchange. Think of all those gift cards that you've just received at Christmas and you release their monetary value by exchanging the voucher code in return for the price. In the same way, Jesus Christ has redeemed us from slavery. When we had to do what we were told or be punished, he released us by exchanging his punishment for ours. Or as Paul puts it himself in Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. He exchanged his death for our freedom by taking his punishment as our punishment, by taking our punishment, our curse upon himself. It's as if you had a receipt with all the debts that you owe to God all the things that you're most ashamed of. And on the back, Jesus has written, paid in full. Paid in full. He redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we might be free, so that we might no longer be slaves. But even better, verse 5, so that we might receive adoption as sons. In other words, not only are we free, not only have all our debts been paid, but we've also received the full legal status as God's beloved children. It's as if we had not only a receipt stamped paid in full, but also a birth certificate stamped with the words, child of God. And every aspect of Jesus' arrival, from his divinity, to his humanity, to his obedience, to his death, all of it was brought about by God at precisely the right time in history so that we might receive that adoption as God's children. John Stott puts it with signature clarity in his commentary on Galatians. If Jesus had not been man, he could not have redeemed men. If he had not been a righteous man, he could not have redeemed unrighteous men. And if he had not been God's son, he could not have redeemed men for God or made them the sons of God. But because Jesus is all of those things, he has completely changed our spiritual status before God, from slaves to sons. And because we are God's sons, secondly, God has given us the spirit of his son. God sent his spirit, verse 6, 
And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The spirit here is called the spirit of the son because he proceeds from the son eternally because he empowered the son for his ministry, because he raised the son from the dead, because the father has poured him out at the request of the son, because everywhere he goes, he opens hearts and minds to receive the son, because he works in everything he does to glorify and exalt the son. That is the spirit whom God has put into our hearts where he works to kindle a sense of sonship that befits our spiritual status by crying out, Abba, Father. The title Abba is a deeply personal one. It literally means my father. It speaks of an intimate confidence, of gracious filial sincerity. John Owen, the Puritan theologian, calls it a holy boldness. I rather like that. Because of God's spirit, we can come before God and call him my father. Not presumptuously, not arrogantly, but with a holy boldness. Because the eternal son has given us a share in his status It's a wonderfully Trinitarian gospel, isn't it? God the Father sent his son to redeem us from sin and his spirit that we might be adopted as sons. John Stott hits the nail on the head once again. Thus God's purpose was not only to secure our sonship by his son, but also to assure us of it by his spirit. He sent his son that we might have the status of sonship. And he sent his spirit that we might have an experience of it. Once we had rules, but now we have a relationship. Once we had fear, now we have fellowship. Once we were slaves, now we are sons. When I was six years old, my parents took me and my brother on holiday to China. It was an amazing trip. And when you're six years old, there's very little that's more exciting than getting to sit on an airplane for six hours and watch your own personal television screen. Very exciting. But the reason we'd gone was not just for a holiday. It was to actually to adopt my little sister, Lydia. For the first year of her life, she'd lived in an orphanage in China, I suppose being looked after by various nannies and childminders. But when my parents signed the adoption papers and she was handed over to them, her status radically changed. At first, I imagine she just thought she'd been handed over to a new set of nannies. But over time, she grew to learn that my parents treated her differently that her standing in their eyes wasn't dependent on her behavior, that they loved her unconditionally, that she could call them mum, dad. That is what has happened to us through Jesus. We were children, enslaved under guardians and managers. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. It certainly makes you grateful for Christmas, doesn't it? At least it does me. And it also has the power to shape the year ahead. For the Galatians, I guess this passage would have come as a fairly stinging rebuke, or at least as an urgent call for an about turn. They were really on the brink of fully submitting themselves to this legalism, to this new form of slavery. And Paul wrote this passage to call them back. Verse 8, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. 
But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more? Don't go back to slavery now that you're sons. I imagine for most of us, we aren't quite so close to the brink as the Galatians were. And yet we still need to be reminded of God's grace, don't we? Perhaps especially at the start of a new year, on the brink of January, it's worth asking ourselves, how do we plan to serve in the year ahead? Will it be as slaves, trying to earn brownie points with God, fearing punishment if we fail, however subconsciously? Or will it be as sons, dependent on his grace, confident in our adoption as his children. Imagine three men working in a pub kitchen. The first one works rather carelessly and haphazardly, only ever doing the minimum amount to make sure that he earns his paycheck. The second works frantically hard, terrified that if he doesn't impress his boss, he'll get the sack. The third one works cheerfully, diligently, carefully, confidently, because he knows his father owns the business, and one day it will belong to him too. The kingdom of heaven is not a servant's wage. It is a son's inheritance. And that makes all the difference as we set out to serve the Lord in another year. Let's pray together. The Collect for the Sunday after Christmas. Almighty God, who has given us thy only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made thy children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by thy Holy Spirit, through the same our Lord Jesus Christ who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the same Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen.